Okay, I think then we just start because we have some slides in front of us. Um, for everybody or all the people who join Daniel's talk, you should be already in the right state of mind for this, what is, hap what is happening in the next 40 minutes. Um, basically, he introduced you to the idea to have some kind of conversation with the compiler to teach him something. We now try to push that to the max, to, to push it as far as we can, to push as much work we have usually to do to the compiler to let him figure out how to find a solution for, for some problem we have. And basically we make it a really intense, long conversation with the compiler. Um, and we try to restrict ourselves to just use the tools the, the programming language that Scala provides to us. So we don't try to use macros as long as uh, we try to avoid macros as long as possible. We just want to use with the tools we have at hand with Scala itself. And let's try or figure out how far we can go with that. Um, as I said, or as the title says, we try to, or our task today, or with this talk, is to arrive an HTTP client function just from a mirror type. That's what we want to do, what, that's what we want to convince the compiler to do for us. Um, our task looks something like this. So we have this endpoint, which just gets us a list of users depending um, on the name and some minimum age. So he has to return us all the users which have this name and a minimum age. And what we want to get in return is we want to somehow represent this endpoint on the type level, so as a, as a pure type. And the compiler has to find for us something which a function which looks something like this. So a function which takes a name, takes a minimum age, and returns us some, some list of users in some effectful context, some uh, either future or I.O. or whatnot. So this whole step, this creation of this function, the compiler should do that. We don't want to write that on our own. We don't want to do this lag work. And the basis for doing that is type-level programming. And this basically, the, 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 the basis for this talk is what is type-level type programming and how, how you do it in Scala and how to use it to solve some problems and what are the benefits and what are the costs you have to pay when you use it. Um, my summary of what, what type-level programming is, is basically you try to describe your computation as types, uh, which then gets evaluated, so executed by the compiler. So you just move this coding and execution one level up. Instead of writing your code as code and uh, some runtime environment is, is executing it, you just push it all one level up to, to, to push it to the compile time. And we need two basic concepts to, to understand how to do this. The first concept is we have to represent our information which describe our data, which describe our computation on the type level. And to do so, we have to use singleton types. What that is, I will describe later on just for you to know. This is one thing, you, one takeaway you have to, to, not you have to get, but which I try to explain to you is using singleton types to uh, represent your data and computation on the type level. And the second concept is using recursive implicit resolution, so the uh, implicit resolution mechanism, but in a recursive way to represent uh, or to do this computation. So to do the evaluation, the computation, you have to use implicit recursive re um, resolution, and that's something we also will talk about, what it is, how to use it, and how it works in the background. And once you get the gist or the idea of how this works, maybe not with this talk, but maybe when you continue reading mat material about this, listening to other talks, you might realize that there are many things you can move to the type level, many things you can convince the compiler to do for you instead of you writing the code and instead of you doing all this stuff. And yeah, also we re um, what I forget to tell you is, um, yeah, or basically when we talk about type level programming, there are benefits and costs you have to pay, what I said. And I mean, the benefits, the one benefit is you make your types really expressive. You express your computation, what you want to do on the type level. That means um, you reduce the surface area for uh, area for errors, so you can do less errors in your code because you made your type re types really expressive. Um, the next thing is you just scrap a lot of boilerplate. You don't have to write a lot, uh, or you can move a lot of work, lack work you have to do usually on your own to the compiler, and you don't have to do. Yeah, you, you don't have to write the code on your own. You have to. Yeah, you don't have to write it. You don't have to maintain it. You don't have to test it. Um, on the other side, of course, there's a cost, and this cost comes in form of compilation time. Now, 
since you um, you don't have to invest the time to write the code, the compiler has to figure out how to solve the problem, so he has to invest the time. And then you end up maybe with unacceptable compile times, and you have to start to tweak your 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 code to make it faster, or even you end up with scenarios where it simply does not make any sense anymore to move that onto to the to the type level, because the compile times just go through the roof, and you I experienced compile times up to 45 minutes or two hours for projects where we just push that too far, where we try to push too much to the type level. So this is a cost you have to keep in mind. It's something um, what you pay for to get this power. Uh, short introduction of myself. Uh, my name is Paul Heimann. I work as a data engineer at the professional social network Sing. It's basically we keep LinkedIn at bay in the German-speaking countries. So this is basically a competitor to LinkedIn. And yeah, I basically write Scala services day in and out, so recommend uh, recommender and libraries which um, support to build this recommender and other stuff related to data science services. Um, I also do some Scala trainings, functional programming and Scala trainings uh, internally within Xing and sometimes externally. Um, I also open sourced one of my workshops, which is a five days workshop on functional programming Scala. So if you're interested in something like this, you can just, there are slides, exercises, project in there, just if you want to learn something about functional programming Scala, it's just for free. And I do some open source work, uh, basically this is just my uh, GitHub handle. Um, but now let's just start. Um, no, 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 seems like we do not start. Okay, I just continue with uh, my notebook. Um, the first thing you have to do is to represent this API, to represent this endpoint as a type. So we have to move this description we had as a comment or as a string to the, to the type level. And again, this is the endpoint of the API we want to describe. Um, and just let's start with one of the simpler elements, the static path element, users. What we want to do, what we want to have is something where we say, okay, um, users is literal, and I want to have a specific type representation of this literal on the type level. So what I want is a literal type. A literal type is basically this string literal encoded on the type level. There is a representation of literal types within the Scala compiler, within the vanilla Scala compiler, which is right now 2.12, but you have no access to it. You get access to literal types in 13, I think, and you get it in Dory, so it's Scala free. But right now with Scala 2.12, you don't have access to it. It's enclosed within the compiler, which is kind of a bummer because we need this information. We have to somehow represent it on a type level. What we can do is, nope. What we can do is refer to the library shapeless. You heard it before from Daniel, which comes with some nice tools when it comes to type level programming. And shapeless has a class in it which is called witness. Witness is basically a macro we have to use here at this point to uh, bypass the problem, this, or this limitation of the Scala compiler we have, to extract the literal type from the internal representation of the compiler. Basically, what it does is you give it a literal or some singleton. Uh, singleton value and it can extract for you the singleton type, in this case the literal type, from the internal representation for you. So when we use it, what we have to do is we create a witness from the string users and what we get back is uh, the witness which then extracts the literal type and we get access to the literal type by just saying, okay, give me this T, this literal type, this re literal representation on the type level of the string. But this also puts this restriction of that we have to create this value first to get access to the literal type. So did that restricts us to that we have to first go through the value level to get access to the literal type to so then go back to the type level, which is kind of again of a bummer and restriction of Scala 2.12, but this problem should just go away with 2.13 and uh, Scala 3 where you just can directly use a literal type. So for now you have to accept that we have to go first through the value level to get access to the type level because we have to go through the hoops of extracting internal uh, compiler representations of uh, certain types. Now we have our literal type, we can represent this static path element on the type level, now we have to make it a bit more precise to say this is a path element to make it more specific. So basically we want to tag this, this, this type. What we do is we create uh, this path trait, or this straight path, 
we make it seed and we provide no inhabitant. So this is a pure type. It has no value level representation. We only use it to tag our literal type as this is a path element. So basically what we end up with is something we say, we have a path element and is, it is a literal, literal type uses. So we encoded the information, we have a static path element and what it is named on the type level. And that basically is the whole trick when moving stuff to the type level. So you use singleton types. So path in a sense is also kind of a singleton type because there's only one representation. It's a path C, C tray path itself. And you use something like literal types to move value level information to the type level. And you combine them to get a really expressive or to get a way to express your problems precisely on the type level. When we continue with that, we have the segments or the dynamic part in, in our path. Uh, what we do is say we create a new type segment which has a key, so the name of the segment and a value which is the expected input type of this of the segment. In this case we say it's a name so we expect it to be a string. Again, we derive a witness so we try to find the literal type for the name of the segment, so the, uh, the basically literal type for name and then we just create this type representation. We say we have a, uh, we have a segment which has a name name, so which has a key name and ex it expects a string as an input. So we do exactly the same thing for the query. So we say we have a type query and we derive the literal type for the key of this query and we just store this information in this type. So we say we have a query with a uh, literal type, so with a key which is called min h and it expects an integer as input. Last thing we do is uh, we have to say which kind of method we use and what kind of type we return. So we just create again pure types or traits without inhabitants and then just say I have a get method which returns me a list of users. So this is basically just straightforward. We don't have to use uh, literal types here. Um, now we have all this stuff. So we have these different elements for our API type. Now we have to put it together. You have to make it one concise or uh, not concise but one API description, type level description of IP our API. And whoa. Yeah, and what we do is basically we use another uh, tool from the library shapeless which is called ageless, uh, which basically is a list with heterogeneous types so you can put elements of different types into this list. And what we do here is basically putting all these elements into an ageless. So what we achieved here is basically this description of our endpoint of our API is now on the type level. This is basically one to one the same description. It, it holds the same information. And that's what we wanted. We wanted to get a type level description of our API endpoint. Now you might say, I probably don't want to write the witnesses all the time. I don't want my users, so maybe I write an API uh, uh, or a library which should be used in some code base. I don't want to my, my users of my library to write witnesses all the time and probably also I don't want them to write age lists all the time. This should be an implementation detail and hidden in the background. So what we do want to have is something like this, where we just have a nice DSL where, you, where we put all the things together, where witnesses are derived automatically and we just in the end get the same type. We could just get it not for free, but it is done in the background by this DSL. Um, what you do first have to do, so when you look back, so... Oh, no. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah, yeah. Okay. When you look back, um, the first thing we have to provide this a get method or the method and the return type and the problem is as I said this these are sealed traits so we can we provided no implementations for that so this is a pure type it has no inhabitants you cannot just pass a value for this thing it's the idea is that this is just a type um, what we have to do is we have to provide some carrier on the on the value level to pass on this information again this whole problem is with witness that we have to go the through the value level to to extract all the information we need for now so for pure types, what you have to do, we have to pri provide something which carries the type for us on the value level. So we create just something like this case class, which has a type parameter, but nothing else. The only thing it does is carrying around this type parameter for you. And then we just can create a method get, which just creates me a type carrier with, with the type, the method, uh, or the method type get and the output uh, type we expect. Um, then we have the path part, so where we try to create our, our path for our endpoint. And what we do is we have to create some builder, which again is basically a carrier for our type, which here stores uh, the ageless for our path. 
And then we just provide some nice DSL methods to so that it looks like as if we would build this path. And basically what it does is when you provide a string here, shapeless comes with an implicit uh, conversion where it takes a string literal and transforms it into a witness. So when you use this, for the user it looks like he just passes a string. In the background, this is transformed to a witness and you get access to the literal type from uh, for, uh, of this literal string, the string literal. And so basically we got uh, just get access to the literal type and we just prepend it to our age list. So what we do here basically is uh, build up the path in a reverse order. And then we just start with the root, which is just the, the empty state where we have just an empty age list type. And when we use it, it looks something like this. So that's something we want to have in a, a nice DSL. We said we start with an empty path of the root and the uh, route root. And you say, I have one static element, uh, one path element I call users. Um, but all this information then again is just stored as an H list type. There's no value level representation of that. Uh, then we have the segment. So what we want to do is something where we say we have an expected input type of this dynamic field and it has a name. The segment has a name. And this should then create this type segment with the literal type and the expected input type. Um, oh yeah, this will happen from time to time because uh, the width of this beamer is not wide enough for all the type information. <laughs> Uh, what we basically have to create is this helper function where we say, okay, we first provide the uh, expected input type, as we see have seen it before here. So we say it's a string, and then we create this helper class, which basically is just a function again, which then takes a string literal, transforms it into a witness, so we get access to literal type, and then we can just put all the stuff here into a type carrier where we say this is a segment with a key and a value type, and then we just can uh, pass it on, pass on this information. And we pass it on by just providing another DSL method where we say, here we expect a type carrier which has a segment. We just take the whole segment and put it into our path, uh, path type in our HDS type for the path. So using that, basically you end up with something like this. What you do here is building up on the type level a representation on this, of this path without explicitly writing down the witnesses or creating the witnesses uh, and building this, all the stuff uh, on by hand. So basically it's more or less automated in the background. Um, you would do exactly the same thing for the query, so there's nothing special about the queries here, so I simply don't, I just skip this part, it's equivalent in how you do this. So what we end up with is kind of this beast. So <laughs> you say you expect a method, and um, actually this is wrong, I see right now. This should be, I expect a type carrier which then stores a method for me. Uh, I expect this path builder which has the path has an ageless type stored in it. I expect a query builder, which then again has an ageless with the query stored on the ageless for you. And what I do is, now I have to put this all together into one single ageless type. So what I do is I use another type class from Shapeless, which is called prepend, where you can just prepend one ageless uh, in front of another ageless. Um, yeah, that's basically what we want to do. So we say prepend Q in front of P, and the result is then uh, I call API, so this is a final, or this is then the combination of these two H lists. Uh, since, as I said, we create the H list for path and query in reverse order, we have to put the queries in front of the path so that this whole thing is in reverse order. Because the next thing we will do is reverse it again so that it's in correct order. This is another type class from Shapeless where you then can say, I have a type for uh, an H list or I have an H list, please return, uh, reverse this H list for me. So that now the result of this reverse then creates us the correct type. The, cor uh, the, the elements are in the correct order. And basically what I do is I just add the method type in front of all this stuff. And I, what I end up with is exactly what you saw, saw in the beginning. So when you use it, it looks something like this. And what we get back is this uh, H list type. So the type we wanted to have, we created before by hand. Now, just now, all the things are automated. We don't. The user don't have has to know that we use age lists in the background, that we use witnesses in the background. For him, it's just he has some nice DSL. Just use it, and, uh, and it's fine. So now that we have described, or that we know that we have a description of our API on the type level, the next thing we have to do is to derive the client to somehow convince the compiler to do some computation with this information to build up a function for us. And so what we want to do is we have this API and we want to call some derived function 
And what we want to end up with is that thing. So for now we say, uh, what, what we want to end up with some, a function which takes a string and inter integer to the name and the age, and it returns us a list of users. And for now I just fix that to IO to make it a bit easier later on to, to handle all this stuff. But you could still make this generic over any F and just provide a solution for any kind of F. So futures, IO, option, or whatnot. Um, but the question is, what kind of information do we need to to derive this function. So how do we have to represent our API to, to get access to all this information we need to derive this function? The, uh, looking at what we want to achieve, so what we need is the information which kind of input types I expect. So I have to know that I expect a string and that I expect an integer, and I have to know that I return a list of users. So that's uh, these are the two things from looking at what we want to achieve, what I have to know. Um, but this is not enough to make a re HTTP request, so you need even more information. And first of all, we have to figure out how what it looks like to do an HTTP request in this setup. And therefore, we create a type class we call just HTTP request, and this needs information, uh, a bit more information where you say, I have to know which kind of method I, I am, so which kind of uh, HTTP call I do. I probably have to know which, which context I am. I have to know which kind of client I use in the backend. So do, do I use HTTP4S? Do I use, uh, use Akka HTTP? Or I, am I on Scala.js and use um, the Scala.js API for, for HTTP calls? And I have to know what kind of value I output. Um, so basically, we need some more information to, to make this fly, to make this happen. Um, so when we look at this, what boils down to is we have to know the different input types to, to, to generate our function. We have to know the method and return type. We have to somehow get hold on uh, a list of path elements so that an HTTP framework can actually do the request, knows where you ha has to in which direction it has to do this request. And we need the map of queries to specify what kind of request we want to do. And this basically means um, we have to reshape our API type to something which represents this information we need a bit better or makes it or makes it easier to access this information. So what we want to do is to take our API type and transform it to this tuple. Uh, we should just start at the bottom. Um, so what we see here is basically just the output. So for a list, of, uh, a list of users, we just extracted that. We extracted the method. We just say we have a type get method just to say which kind of method it is. Um, and then we have this these thingies here. Um, these are basically, they run in tandem. And basically, you say, this is my expected input type. And this is the key type to this expected input type. I just separated them into different lists. Um, but they all, as I said, they run in tandem. So this belongs to that uh, type, and this belongs to that type. Um, and then we have this last age list up here, which is basically we will use that as our string we will follow. So this is basically how we then, this we will use that to describe our computation. Because here we just say, I expect a query input. So it can pop this types from this list. Or I say, I, ex I expect a segment input. So I can pop this types from this list. Um, or I just say it's a static path element, uh, it's just a literal type, and then I can just use it to add it to my list of path, uh, path elements I need to, uh, or I use later on to do the actual request. So this you can think of as like the string where we describe our computation with, uh, or string of events we do describe our computation with. Um, but now the question is, there are tools in Shapeless to transform value level representation of an age list. So you can do a fold, basically, what that, that's what we want to do. We can fold an age list. But there's so far no tool to just transform a type of an age list because we have no value level representation. So we have to build this on our own. We have to make this transformation of a single age list to some completely new cha shape, in this case, this tuple. And what we do to achieve that is basically we leverage Scala's implicit resolution mechanism um, to iterate over an ageless type and create a new type out of it, to create a new uh, a type which has a different shape than the original ageless type. And we do this by applying a recursive scheme, basically. Um, so how does it look like? So how does a type level fold a level uh, fold over a just an ageless type look like uh, when we try to implement it? Um, and it's basically the type class we need for that is more or less straightforward, we say we operate over an age list. 
we have some current aggregation state. So in this type, okay, um, this scenario, the aggregation state is some just some type, and we expect some output. So in the end, uh, it has to produce a new type which has a different shape, which is the result of this fold step or of this fold of the HS type. And then we have to use this auxiliary pattern, which just leaves the slide right now, um, which is basically a trick in Scala how you get access to the member type. So out the, the out type is member type, and if you need access to this member type, you have to use this auxiliary pattern. Then you are able to get access to this inner type description in Scala. Starting with, I would say, the simplest case it's a final case, so as in recursion, you have a final case where you stop your recursion and just return your resu result. Uh, you have the same then on the type level, where you say, okay, my age list is empty, so I reached the end of my age list, and I have a current aggregation state, a current aggregation state type, and the only thing I do is I just say, this is my final result. I put this as an output type, and then I'm done. Basically, this is the end of my computation. And then I have the recursive step. For now, this is kind of useless. It's just here for you to understand how this works. Um, basically, what I say is, I right now, uh, in this step, I have an age list which has a head and a tail. And what I do is, basically, um, and I have a current aggregation state. And what I want to do is, like, because we have this recursive step, uh, what we do is we call, or we try to find the next fold step for the remaining part of the list, of the list type. We supply some new aggregation state, we update it. For now, as I said, this is useless. We make this more precise in the next step. Here we just supply the current head. And then in the end, after all this computation is done, we have some output type, some final result of this fold step. And we, by using the aux uh, auxiliary pattern, we get access to it. And basically, what we, the only thing we do is we take this information, we take the final result of this computation and store it as our output type. So we just pass back the result of this fold step to 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 um, to the head of this computation. But as I said, this is right now kind of useless because when we look at this, it just always takes the current head and takes it as a new aggregation state. So in the end, it will just return the type of the last element as the result of this fold step. Uh, so what we have to do is we have to describe different cases, how we fold different types. And we do that with a type level case, where we say we have some input type, we have some current aggregation type, and then we have to describe how we merge them together, how we fold them to uh, produce a new output, to produce a new uh, updated aggregation type. Again, auxiliary pattern to get access of to, to the result of this computation. And then the simplest uh, example here would be that we say, okay, we have the get case, that's basically when I see this get method type, and because it's the first element in the list, we have no aggregation state so far, so we assume the initial state is just unit, but you could use any kind of type for that. Uh, what we do is basically we say we initialize our tuple. Say so far we haven't seen any uh, any elements, no path elements, no queries, no segments, so the free the free um, edge lists are just empty. And I say it's a get, met a get method, and it has an output. So I just put this information into this tuple. And this is my case, my, my transformation case I describe here. Uh, a bit more involved example would then be the query case, uh, just ignoring the signature because it doesn't help for now. It's basically we say we see a query with a key and a value. And what we do is uh, and we, we have a current aggregation state, which is this tuple with elements, key input, value input, method, and output. And what we do is we say we add the query input element to the elements list. We add the key to the key list, the uh, value to the value list. And we simply don't change the method and output because they are not affected by queries. And you do the same thing for segments and for paths. So this is just you make a description how to transform that, how to tr put it into the new representation. Now then, we have to add the cases to um, our recursive fold because that's what we want to do with a recursive step. We want to fold the current information, the current head. So what we do is we have a head. Scala, please find for us a case for this head with the current aggregation state, and please give me the output of this computation. Give me the updated aggregation state, and then we uh, string this this result to the uh, recursive next recursive step, where we say we continue this computation with the tail. Uh, of the list, the no new aggregation state, and then please give me the result of this whole computation and store this in out. Um, when it comes to this thing here, the problem is if you just ignore lazy, you, you don't put this lazy keyword around that, this will not compile. 
Scarlet then has a problem that it tries to find a solution for this thing, it tries to find a solution for this thing, but it hasn't found the C out at that moment, so it cannot find um, a solution for folder. So what you have to do is you have to postpone this recursive, uh, this implicit resolution until this implicit resolution is done, because then you have access or you know this type and then you can find the solution for this type. It's basically a hoop you have to go through when sc with Scala and the implicit resolution mechanism. So when we apply this, so we say, Scala, please find an, uh, find a, the folded type or the new the new shape for our API. It looks something like this. It first does a recursive step, sees uh, the get method at the beginning, so it initializes our uh, new type or our the, the final type we want to have. Then it sees the pa uh, sees in the path element, so it adds the the literal type to to the to the elements list. Then we see a segment, so it adds a segments input element to the elements list, uh, the literal type to the key list, and the input type to the uh, value list. Same for query, and in the end, when we reach the end of this age list, we just return the final type as our result. Um, now we have this new shape, we, we now have all the information as we need them, and now we have to collect the, all the data necessary to do this request. So we have to collect this uh, list of path elements, we have to collect the map of queries. And we do this with another type class, you see a lot of type classes here. <laughs> uh, basically what we say is uh, ty this type class works over this elements, this list of elements, what I said, this is our string we follow to, provide to describe this computation, and we just also provide the type class, the key input list and the value input list so that it can pop out this information when needed. And basically this type class is just a function which gets the inputs expected, this dynamic input, so the segment and the query, and it builds up a path and, a, and the queries map, which in the end it just returns when it reaches the final result. So this is our, this is basically our accumulators, our, uh, our aggregators to, to collect this information. So again, this is recursive, so we start with the final case or return case. It's basically when all the lists are empty, we reach the end, we just found or process the transformation for all the steps. The last thing we do is we just return the path and the, 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 the queries. That's the only thing we do. The recursive step looks something like this, for example, for, for again for the queries. I think I have a reduced uh, version again because the signature is not helping again. <laughs> and what we say is when we see a query input, pop the key and the value type, because we know we have, this is now the thing we are working with. We know the inputs, the hat has to type, uh, has to have the type value, uh, to the type V, because this is the current hat of our uh, expected input type list. And what you do is basically, you pop this hat from here, so we just continue to work with the tail, we just uh, remove it from our input list. Uh, we don't change the path because we queries don't have uh, um, effects on the path itself. And we add a new pair to our queries map where we say, uh, Scala, please find me um, the le value level representation of this liter literal type so that I can use it as a key. And just take the input, the head of the input, and put it into this list so that we get this key value pair of what is the name of the query and what is the current value of. Uh, um, of this tuple, not of query, but of this tuple. And basically, you then again, you use the same d thing for segments and you do a comparable thing with, uh, uh, with the path elements. And what you end up with is basically this nested function call structure. So Scala derived for you a nested function call structure. So when we try to implicitly resolve it for the current types we have, you and you would call it you would call it with an age list where you say the age is 2019 years and his name is Gandalf and we start with an empty list and we start with an empty map and the first thing it does is it pops uh, pops the hat because we are working with queries and adds this query to the query map and the next step I think it, it sees um, it's a uh, uh, it's a segment so the, the dynamic path element so we pop again this element from our inputs list. Um, Add it to the path to, to, to the path list. We don't touch the queries because they're not uh, affected by, by, by segments. Last thing is we see um, the static path element users. We add just the literal uh, the type uh, value level representation of this literal type to the path list. And in the end, we just return the list of path elements and the map of queries. Um, now we have to put it all together to get an HTTP client. 
And when you would write it by hand, it would look something like this. So we would say, please try to find an instance of the type class HTTP request for, in this case, for HTTP4S with I.O. And then we would write this function where we say, expect a string, I expect an integer, get back the I.O. list of users. And what I do is basically I, I derive the builder, I call it with this input values, get back the path and queries, provide the path and queries to the instance of the HTTP uh, request type class, and it does the extra side effect and returns us the list of users. But then again, um, you don't want your users to write that. This should also be automated. So what we have to do is to write this monstrosity here um, with a lot of type information at the head. And basically, but when you take a closer look, what happens is basically you provide the type, uh, the API type, then you do the fold step, where you say, take the h list, fold it to the tuple, so the thing we did before. Again, we have to make it lazy because there are some problems with where we say we expect it to have this shape, and Scala cannot prove it that it has this shape, so we have to make it lazy so that it can do the computation first, so that it then can prove that the result has this shape. Um, then we try to find a request data builder for this, new, Im for this uh, new information we got out of this. And we try to find an HTTP request instance um, for for the method and for uh, for uh, here we fixed it to I/O. As I said, you can make a generic over app. You just fix it here to make it a bit easier for I/O and for some client. And what we return is a function which gets a client, gets the H list of inputs we expect, and returns us the I/O of expected outputs. So basically, we just apply the thing we saw before, which we applied by hand, is now automated when we use it. It looks something like this. So you call derive, it derives, uh, it faults your API type, it derives this builder function for you, and then applies the results of this builder function to the instance of the HTTP request type class. So this actually already works. We have a function, we just convince the compiler to derive this function for us to make an HTTP request based on the API type we provided. Again, stupid thing is, now a user has to write H list, and we don't want them to write an H list. We want them to use that as if it would be a function, so with two parameters, string and integer. So then we have to uh, use, I think, the last type class for now from shapeless, which is basically called function from product. And what it does is when you provide it a function from an H list to something else, it returns you a function uh, with, with a signature where the parameters represent this H list. So if you have an H list of string and uh, string and integer to list of users, it transforms that to a, uh, to a function from string parameter and integer parameter to a list of users. That's basically what we want here. Uh, we just use it as, we basically we just apply the instance of this uh, type class. And now when we use it, we get a function which actually looks like a function. So we have a parameter list. We can provide all the dynamic parts of our requests to the call and it just does the um, side effect, so it does this HTTP call. So basically, now we convince the compiler that we can somehow represent our type, uh, our API as a type, and we convince the compiler to derive this HTTP client function for us. So yay, we did what we want, or we achieved what we wanted to do. It was just kind of a long conversation. <laughs> um, so, so I have a small summary. What I said, the two things, the two takeaways, the two concepts you have to use to make this work in Scala. First thing is you have to use singleton types to represent, represent your information on the type level. For now, with Scala 212, you have to go through the value level. You have to use witnesses to get access, access to compiler internals to the internal representation of literal types. With 2.13 and .d, you don't have to do this anymore. You can purely describe this whole thing on the type level. Um, and you have to use implicit recursive resolution to describe this computation. So basically, what we did with folder, um, you just implicitly resolve the same type class all over again and just make one element, in this case, the h is smaller and smaller and smaller until you reach the final case where the uh, h is type is empty and it, yet then you just return your final result. Um, you could do this now all on your own. Or, and this is a shameless plug, I already provide an, an, a library for that. And basically, it's able to derive HTTP clients uh, for all kinds of uh, effectful um, context, so for all kinds of apps for you. It's also able to derive servers for you from that. 
And the nice thing is then you can use it kind of as a, as a contract between the client and the server. So when both derive, when the server derives its server um, function from this type and the client derives its client function from this type, you can be sure that they follow this protocol, that they obey this protocol. It's kind of a contract between client and server. Um, as a side note, what when it comes to the costs, so for now, for right now, the implementation is more or less equivalent to the things you saw in this talk, um, which makes it quite slow. So I have to do some improvements there. I have to do some performance improvement when it comes to implicit resolution. So right now, this thing has uh, exponential uh, uh, creates an exponential search, spa search space. So when you create a huge description of an API with multiple endpoints, which you also can do. This can take really long, like really long. It can take hours or days in the worst case before it finishes to compile. Um, there are ways to fix this problem. So far, I hadn't the time to fix them, but uh, this is something what I said, the cost you have to pay. If you are not really careful with how you do this implicit resolution, you could end up with an uh, exponential search space and then you end up with really long compile times. Um, so at the end of my talk, thank you for being here, thank you for listening, thank you the Scala IO staff for organizing that, and do you have any questions? I just broke people. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, did you consider using the type level compiler? They're supposed to integrate uh, the literals uh, no, I mean, there's well. since they have to backport this merged feature of literal types, that you get access to that, uh, it has to end up in Scala, which it does with 213 and Dotty. And what I wanted to do is just to do it in vanilla Scala. Because basically, in the end, vanilla Scala is used everywhere. Yeah. Just a minority is using a type level compiler. So I was concentrating on vanilla Scala. And for now, then that's the reason why you have to use the witnesses or this witness class to get access to literary types. Thanks. So, how do you count to how, how do you plan to reduce the um, uh, search space for implicit? So, I mean, that there are some low hanging fruits where you can reduce the constant part of this complexity equation. So, instead of having this three steps or two steps to, to derive the function, I would fuse them. That would be the first thing, just the low hanging fruit, fuse them into one big step uh, so that you don't have to do this rec uh, implicit resolution multiple times. Um, then, I have to use it some, as you saw, this lazy thing, which also does not help really. There are other ways to achieve the same. They're not that uh, not so elegant, but um, where I can prove that, for example, with the fold step, that in the end the shape has to be a tuple. You can prove that by providing a type class which says it is a tuple, so I don't have to use lazy. So it's also kind of a low hanging fruit, but it just solves the constant part of this equation. So it moves the problem where you run into this hard exponential space a bit to the back. Uh, when it comes to the exponential part, I have to take a look into where uh, you can activate. When you run the Scala compile, you can activate a flag which locks you all the the, the implicit uh, resolutions the Scala compiler goes through. So you see what he actually is searching for. And I have to look if their exponential search usually means there's somehow a loop where he starts to so, uh, not directly find the thing he has to find, but he goes through a, a lot of steps before he finds it. And then I have to fine tune where I put the implicits to make it for the Scala compiler easier to find the correct implicits as fast as possible. And then you may be able to pu push that back to linear to a linear complexity. And then it would be somehow fine again. Then maybe it compiles in 20 seconds and not in 20 hours, which is OK for what you do there. Thank you for the talk. My question is, uh, have you ever thought about uh, using the library as a contract between the back end and the front end, whatever the language is between the, because in our company, the, our front end is in JavaScript mm -hmm. and our back end is in Scala? I mean, of course, this is now tied to Scala because this is a Scala specific solution. What you could do is, of course, use Scala JS to write your front end because I also provide the <laughs> implementation for Scala JS for this yeah. thing, then it would work. But of course, when you have different languages, then you cannot use this uh, programming specific protocol because this relies on how Scala is resolving 
uh, implicit or how Scala works in the end, uh, what you then want to use is something like, uh, I think it's open API or how it's called, which is then uh, a programming agnostic specification of what you actually want to achieve in your system, what you want to do. And then you can use it, I think it's some text file, and you can then just, yeah. for different programming languages, derive clients and servers from this. Like or maybe even generate protobuf files. Or something yeah, something like that. But this is, re this is really a... Uh, just focus on... I mean, it could now. generate the specification. You just could, instead of deriving a function, uh, you just throw that away and derive uh, something which then creates you the specification. So this file, you could do that. But if it just comes how this thing works, this is Scala-specific. You can make it in a way that it, you can use it with other programming languages, uh, but then you rely on some text format uh, specification which you derive from this type. Okay. Uh, and then just a, uh, a quick uh, remark. Uh, thank you for the talk because you you explain how your library your library works. This this uh, this enables contributors, future contributors, mm -hmm. to to have an earlier understanding before. Contributing, and I think it's good. So, thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, you're welcome. <laughs> the problem is when people see that. I mean, you look at this code; it's barely readable because you have all uh, Scala is very verbose when it comes to type level stuff. So yeah. you have to write a lot of type parameters, make restrictions on them, and all the stuff, and it's type sometimes really hard to read. Yeah, but at least we have uh, some a little idea about uh, how how what what we can expect. Mm -hmm. Okay, then thanks again. <laughs>